All right. <laughs> We're on the home stretch. We've almost made it through a day. How about that? Almost survived. Can somebody drive you home? That's an additional charge. Okay, so we have started this discussion of ownership interest. We've talked so far about be simple absolute, which means what? Forever, whatever, right? You can do whatever you want, and you own it for forever. And then we talked about limiting time. And time limits is how, how do we limit time of ownership? Life estates. What else do you think we need to learn how to limit? If we've talked about time, what else can be limited? Whatever you use. Whatever you use it for. We want to talk about limitations of use. And that's where we talk about these fee simple defeasible ownership interests. It's still ownership. You still own the property. But what is going to be limited? Now you're not going to own it. It's, it's not time that's limited. You own it forever. But what is limited about it? The use. the use. What you can do with the property. And again, who's placing this restriction? Who's restricting your use? The previous owner, right? We call them the what? What's that G word? The grantor. The grantor who's giving you ownership is placing this restriction on the property. Now, unlike life estates, life estates are destined to end at some point, right? And eventually, whether it's a reversionary interest or a remainder interest, they're going to end up owning it fee simple absolute. All the restrictions go away. These restrictions are pertinent. Which means these restrictions are going to last for how long? Forever. 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 So when you when a grantor places this kind of restriction on the property, this restriction is going to last forever. Not only the owner that I grant it to has to follow this restriction, but anybody they sell it to, gift it to, give it to, leave it as an inheritance, every subsequent owner is going to have to honor these restrictions. Does that make sense for you guys? Yes. Okay, because these are going to be a pertinent restriction. So the first one is called a fee simple determinable ownership. Fee simple determinable ownership. So, let's talk about that. It says a bit that the grantor decides what the one allowable use is for the property. The grantor decides what the, how many? One. one allowable use is for the property. Latasha, you own this property so long as you only use it for a park. How many things can Latasha do with that property? Just the one. It, can she sell the property to somebody else? Yes. 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 What can they use it for? A park. A park. Can they sell it to somebody else? Yes. What can that person use it for? And how long is that restriction going to be in place? Forever. Forever. Is that going to dramatically limit the marketability of that property? Yes. It absolutely is. What do you think would happen if Latasha did something other than a park with the property? She would lose her ownership and it would come back to me. It would come back to the original grantor. This is done when the grantor wants to have very tight control over what a property is used for. When can you think of grantors doing something like this? A church. Yeah, church. What about a church? Yeah, church? What about it? They only want, like in the building or a lot or they only want it to be used as a church. So they're giving it to the church. Somebody's gifting it to the church? Gifting to the church, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Gifts. That's when this is done. When you because if I'm if somebody comes to me, if the University of North Carolina comes to me and I own land in Chapel Hill and I got a soft spot for UNC, obviously, and they say, look, we need this land to build a cultural center on it. I would say, okay, I might consider giving you the property, but if I give it to you, it can only be used as a cultural because I well, here's what I don't want them to do. 50 years down the road, I don't want them selling making money off of it. Because if somebody's going to sell it and make money off of it, that should be who? Yeah. Me. If I'm giving it to you, damn if you're going to make money off of it, right? <laughs> but 
That's when people do this. When they give it as a gift. So they place this restriction, which essentially locks the use down to that one thing that you gave it to them for. Does that make sense? That's when these fee simple determinable. This is a very strict restriction. Because, how many, again, how many things can you now do with the property? One. That's it. Now, we can limit use but not be nearly that strict. We can say, Latasha, you own the property as long as you don't put a trailer park here. I'm selling you the property, and the only thing you can't do with it is put a trailer park on it. What can she do with the property? A whole lot of things, right? But what can she not do? Trailer park. That is called a fee simple subject to a condition. She owns it, and she can do anything with it except one condition. She can do anything except one. Which one's more strict? Fee simple determinable or fee simple subject to a condition? Determinable. determinable is much more strict, right? That's like your. So I like to think of it as like your parents when you're a teenager, right? If mom says, "Listen, you go to the movies. But you don't go anywhere else." And you be outside at 9.30 and we'll pick you up. <laughs> That's fee simple determinable. <laughs> if dad says, just be home by 10 o'clock. <laughs> That's fee simple subject to a condition. <laughs> because which one leaves a whole heck of a lot of flexibility about what's going to happen during that night? You see what I mean? Is there a dramatic difference between the two? You talk about owning the property, right? So fee simple subject to a condition is actually pretty loose. So when would somebody do that? This is not usually a gift. This is actually usually a sale. Think of times when you might want to sell a piece of property but prevent them from using it for a certain thing. How about if you own the property next door? What if you own two lots and you're selling the lot beside you? Might you want to restrict the kind of house they put on that property? Like, sorry. Might, might you want to say no trailers? No, trailers. <laughs> no, manu no manufacturer could. Might you want to do that if you're going to have the lot next door? Would it devalue your property if somebody put a double wide on the lot next door to you? Absolutely. So might you want to restrict it? You say I'll sell it to you, but you can't put a trailer there. That would be fee simple, subject to a condition. I'm sure you do. It's horrible. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Does that make sense? Does everybody follow this idea of fee simple subject to a condition? Fee simple determinable is very strict. In fee simple determinable, the grantor has said you can do how many things? One. One. That's it. That's it. Are we good on me? If you break the rules, what happens to your ownership? You lose it. You lose it. You lose it. You lose it. it goes back. It goes back. How many of you are familiar with the Dorothy and Dex property? You want to talk about dirty pool? How many of you are familiar with the Dorothea Dix property in downtown Raleigh? Those of you that are from Raleigh are familiar with it. If you're not, let me introduce you to Miss Dorothea Dix. She was a very troubled young woman. Um, she was a very wealthy young woman. Um, she was an only child. Her parents were exceptionally wealthy Raleighites. And she was very mentally disturbed. Uh, her parents recognized that she was going to need exceptional care and as they got older, they became concerned about the fact that there really was no mental health care available to a large extent in the state of North Carolina. This was in the early 1900s. And so her parents donated 175 acres in downtown Raleigh to the state of North Carolina for the creation of a state mental hospital, health hospital, mental health hospital. The state mental health hospital became known as Dorothea Dix Hospital. She was the first resident of that hospital. Her parents donated. And they donated that land with a fee simple determinable deed. It was donated and the restriction was it could only be used as what? A state mental health hospital. How many of you are familiar with what's happening with that property right now? It's becoming not just a park. Oh, that would be nice if it was just a park. but. Not just a big park. Are they putting some retail there? Are they putting condos there? How can that, they're so nasty mean, how can they do that? So let's talk about how the state has played dirty pool here. That property was given with a fee simple determinable deed. Could only use it as what? 
The mental health hospital. The state shut down the mental health hospital. It's been non-existent now for almost a decade. What should have happened with that property's ownership? Reverted back to the Dix estate, which is exactly what happened. Did I mention that Dorothy Dix was an only child? Did I mention that both of her parents were only children? What heirs does the Dix family have? None. What happens to property that's owned by somebody who has no heirs and they die? It goes back to the state. And what kind of deed does it have when it goes back to the state this time? Fee, simple, absolute. Ain't that just nasty? Hey, ain't that just nasty? Can you imagine somebody sitting in a room, some attorney coming up with that scheme one day and says, you know, and by the way, the state of North Carolina sold that property to the city of Raleigh for $240 million. Why did they shut the hospital down? Why did they shut the hospital down? Because they could sell the property for $240 million. You want the cynical answer? There it is. And you know, let's just lay it all out there. It certainly is not for lack of need of mental health care in this state. It wasn't like it didn't meet accreditation standards. Oh, no. No, and they didn't replace it either. They, they largely dumped all their occupants out on the street to close it down. Largely. Some of them were moved to Cherry Hill, which is the other state mental health hospital that exists now. But most of them were just dumped out. State shut it down, sold the land to the city of Raleigh for $240 million, and it's now being redeveloped. Isn't that ugly? Yeah, it's, that really is. Can somebody sue the state for doing that? Oh, people tried to block it for years and years and years, but there's nothing to block because the state simply said, you know, we broke the rules and it is sheeted back. I mean, it went back, it reverted back to the Dix family, but, you know, we can't help they didn't have any heirs. Unhuman. It's terrible. 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 Conscience and government kind of don't go along together at all at any level, no matter what, no matter what level of government we're talking about, unfortunately. Um, wish that we could. Um, Thank you. 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 Thank but do we understand it's fee simple to feasible estate? I, I tell that story because I think it helped ram home the idea behind these fee simple determinants. It doesn't always work, but the idea is there. We're good? Now, if somebody popped up and happened to be an heir to the Dix family, they'd be a very wealthy person. <laughs> a very wealthy person. I'm going to try to research my family tree. <laughs> Connection somewhere. <laughs> Auntie Dorothea. You know? All right. Does this chart make more sense now? Yes. Good job. Yeah, it makes more sense now. These are all just breakdowns of ownership, right? What What is the vast majority of ownership is what? Fee simple. Fee simple absolute. Unlimited time, unlimited use. Almost all the time. If we're limiting time, what do we call it? A life estate. And if we're limiting use, we call it fee simple defeasible. Either fee simple subject to a condition or fee simple determinable. That's what it is. Those are the ownership estates. How we feel about that? Pretty decent? Good. Remember, what is an estate? It's just your legal what? Well, it is, ownership is an estate, but there are other types of estates. So an estate is your legal relationship to the property. Because could you have a non-ownership estate, a non-freehold estate, if you had what? A lease. A lease would be a non-freehold estate, because freehold means ownership. So you need to start tying all those vocabulary words together. Everybody okay? Good. Good. Um, let's talk about something called concurrent ownership. This is in your book over on page 34. Well, before we talk about concurrent ownership, let's talk about the, the dumbest terminology in all of real estate. Ownership in several T. How many owners would you think there would be when we say something like ownership in several T? Several, right? Guess how many there are? One. <laughs> ownership in several T means sole ownership. It means there is only one owner of the property. And to this point, isn't that pretty much how we've talked about it? You know, think about all these life estates. I said, Charlotte owns it until Charlotte dies. Well, how many owners do we have? Just the one. Life is not that clean. 
In the real world, people own property together. Things become murkier when people own property together. That's called concurrent ownership. Concurrent means more than one at the same time. That's the meaning of the word concurrent. So when we talk about concurrent ownership, we're talking about ownership by how many people? More than one at the same time. Could it be a hundred? Sure. Could it be two? Yes. Any ownership by more than one person at the same time of a piece of property is called concurrent ownership. Concurrent ownership comes in three options, if you will. They are called tenancy in common, joint tenancy, and tenancy by the entirety. Tenancy in common, joint tenancy, and tenancy by the entirety. If I ask you which one do you think is the most common, what do you think the answer would be? <laughs> Tenancy in common. And indeed, this is one of those times where the, the wording is not confusing, thank God. Okay? Tenancy in common is by far the most common of these three. As a matter of fact, tenancy in common is what it's going to be as long as the concurrent owners, which just means the owners who own it together at the same time, are not one thing. What is that one thing, do you think? Marriage. Marriage. As long as they're not married to each other, they're going to be tenants in common unless they ask for something else. Okay? Does that, does that make sense? Tenants in common is like the default. If Alicia and Tom go out and buy a property, y'all aren't married to each other, correct? Just make sure, get that out there, they're not married to each other. So if Alicia and Tom go out and buy a property together, they are going to purchase it as tenants in common because they're unmarried. They're not married to one another, so the law has a default. It's like, well, we don't know what to make you, so we make you tenants in common. We're going to talk about what that means in just a second, but I want you to understand tenants in common simply means any two or more owners who are not what to each other married to each other are going to be tenants in common there's another one up here anytime they're married it's going to be that one which one do you think that one's going to be by the entirety tenancy by the entirety is ownership of people who are married to one another. I don't say people who are married, they have to be married to one another. Uh, somebody married, it might be somebody else they're buying the property with. But tenancy by the entirety is ownership of two people who are married to one another. So the concurrent owners are married, they're automatically tenants by the entirety. If they're unmarried, they're automatically tenants in common. Well then why the hell are there three? <laughs> Let's talk about why there are three. So, let's talk, before we talk about why there are three, let's talk about the word that matters. The word of the hour, so to speak, since we're going to spend about an hour on this. The word of the hour is survivorship. Survivorship is a very important legal idea. Most of you understand it, but you don't understand it. In other words, you've seen it happen all your life, but you didn't know it was there. How many of you own property with a spouse? How many of you are married and own property with your spouse? All right, so Pat, you, you own a, ha a house with your husband? Wife. Wife, okay. So, you and your wife own property together. Now, if you die, what's going to happen to your ownership interest in that property? She will get it. She will get it. Does everybody agree with that? That's how it works? That's how it works. That is survivorship. That doesn't just magically happen, folks. There's no rule, there's no law that says one spouse automatically inherits the ownership of their departed spouse. They that happens because of this legal idea of survivorship. Now let's compare that. Go ahead. Isn't that because North Carolina is community state? Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with community state. I'm going to tell you what, what it has to do with here in just a second. So let's contrast it with what 
would happen without survivorship? Because it doesn't sound like it really make, ha makes all that much of a difference. Because presumably, could Pat have a will leaving her property to her wife? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Could she? And so the opposite could be true for her wife, correct? Your wife could have a will leaving her property to you. So no matter what happens to either one of you, you're covered, right? Right. That is not nearly as good as survivorship. Do I have anybody in here who's unmarried that owns property together, like a like a significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, anybody in that situation? Anybody ever been in that situation? No, really? Nobody ever? You had a friend in that situation. All right, so let's talk about your friend. He was unmarried. Unmarried. Him and his girlfriend bought a house. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. They buy a house. What happens if one of them dies? What do we have to look at? Well, let's say we don't have survivorship. What do we have to look at? If somebody dies, what do we have to look at to see who owns their property? We gotta look at the will. We gotta look at the will. Because just because I own it with you doesn't mean you're gonna get my half when I die. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> so, your friend and, yep. and his girlfriend, yep. right? Say he dies. Does she have children? No, no children. No children. Did he have children? He didn't have children either. All right, so your friend dies, right? He doesn't have children. He's not married. He has this house with his girlfriend, right? Okay? Does he have parents? Yep. She now owns the house with his parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, she doesn't. Not yet. She owns the house with his estate. His estate has to be probated, folks. How many of you have dealt with that word probate before? Probate can take years. It is a process that can take years. Now, in the meantime, here's what's happened. The girlfriend owns the house in conjunction with his estate. Was she likely getting help making the house payment from him while he was alive? Yes. Is she likely getting that help now? No. Can she afford the house payment by herself? No. Can she sell the house? No. No, because she only owns what? Half. Half of it. She can't sell what she doesn't own. She only owns half of the house. Now, his estate could sell the house, but guess what? They're not allowed to until it's what? Probated. Probated. If he didn't have a will, his parents are going to be left to deal with that. His parents are probably not going to be emotionally in a place to deal with probating that estate. And even if they are, it would probably take up to a year to get it probated. You with me so far on this? She can't sell it. She can't make the house payment. What happens? She goes into foreclosure after Tarantula calls her 15 times. <laughs> she, gets for, she gets foreclosed on. Is that likely what he intended when they bought the house together? What was his probable assumption when they bought the house together? If something happens to me, what's going to happen to it? It's going to go to her. See, because we assume this survivorship thing is there, but it's not. It's only there if you're married. But, 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 sorry, if they took time with joint tenants... We ain't got there yet. Hold on. Hold on. You gotta give me my build up, right? Yeah. Right, 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 right? This survivorship thing is the sole domain of married people. They own it instantly as soon as something happens with to the other because of survivorship. It doesn't have to go to probate. Here's the thing, even if your friend had a will that said his girlfriend was going to get it, she doesn't get it. Guess where it goes first? To probate. So it might take a year for her to get what the will says she's going to get. And if he has debts, guess what? She still ain't going to get it because it's got to be sold to pay off the debts. The odds of her actually taking ownership of this thing are very low because there's no survivorship. Y'all following me on this? Is that an ugly outcome? Because they weren't married. Because they're not married. Because they're not married. Because if they were married, this survivorship thing would be there. And survivorship is automatic when you're married. So when you own property with a spouse in this state, if something happens to one spouse, the ownership instantly transfers over to the other spouse. No probate, no will, 
no nothing. It's no an kids? instant. No kids, no nothing. It is an instant transfer. Does that make sense? That's what survivorship accomplishes. Do you think that there are unmarried people who would like to have that feature be a part of their ownership? Yes. That's why there's three. This one's for married folks and has survivorship, tenancy by the entirety. This one at the top is for unmarried people and doesn't have survivorship. What do you think this one in the middle is? Unmarried people and has survivorship. That's what joint tenancy is. Joint tenancy is meant to mimic the ownership of married couples because it allows unmarried people to have the right of survivorship. Yes, ma'am. Because no rights of survivorship means it can be willed, right? No rights of survivorship means the only way it can transfer is via a will. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. It means that this thing's going to probate. Right, okay. That's what no right of survivorship means. It means that this thing's going to probate. But when it has rights of survivorship, it cannot be willed. It's not going to probate. Okay. When you have a right of survivorship, because it's going to think about probate. To get to probate, we got to read a will, right? Mm -hmm. Survivorship happens when? Instantly. 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 By the time you read the will, the survivorship's done. Survivorship's already done its job because as soon as one owner dies, if the right of survivorship's present, their ownership has instantly been transferred to the other owner. Is that, are you following me on that? Yeah. So, Knowing what you know just about that, if you have a couple who's not married, maybe they're engaged, by the way, engaged is not married. Married is a yes or no question. There's no, it's complicated with marriage. <laughs> marriage itself might be complicated, but you either are or you ain't. One of the two, okay? That especially comes into play when you get separated people. <laughs> You'll have a separated person who's house hunting, and you say to them, are you married? And they say, well, it's complicated. That means yes, by the way. <laughs> Let me translate that. It means yes. Yeah. And that's going to be very bad because guess what? When you are married, you are buying property as tenants by the entirety. Whether you want to or not, don't matter. When you're married, they own half of it. Whether they're part of the transaction. Whether they're part of the transaction or not. Whether they know about it or not, they own half of it. That's what tenancy by the end. That ring is very binding. What do I do? There's a whole lot of, when you say I do, there's a lot of I do's that you really didn't mean to do. Yeah, but you know that. Yeah. Is that closing and you had married couples that had split up a divorce and she went on to marry, all three of them had to sign? Yes. She, so th 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 this was the question. It, you have a married couple who split up and divorced, and then somebody's gotten remarried, and now they want to sell the property, and you got to bring the estranged spouse back in and have them sign? Yes, because the divorce doesn't end the ownership. And they usually don't cooperate. Of course they don't cooperate. Because they want money. They hate you. I always ask, well, do your children live there? They're like, yeah. So you'd rather your home go into foreclosure and then help take care of your children. And they always say, yeah, because I give child support. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm telling you, care. when you start dealing with these marital issues, it can be crazy. I mean, it can, you know, I, I've had people come to me who were legally separated. And I say to them, listen, here's the long and short of it. You can't buy a house right now. Is there a legal way to accomplish it? Sure. Is your spouse going to cooperate? No. Mm -hmm. Show me one that will, and it'll be the first one I've ever seen. Because most often they're in the middle of a bitter fight about everything, right? They're fighting about custody. They're fighting about child support. They're fighting about alimony. They're fighting about this, the house, this or that. So you go to them and say, I'm thinking about buying a house. Will you give up your rights in the property? They're going to use that as some kind of a bargaining tool for something that's got nothing to do with it. So the reality is, what are they going to have to wait until they're what? Divorced. Divorced. Again, married is a yes or no question, not it's complicated. You either are or you're not. So if you have to, a couple who's unmarried, they're dating, maybe they're engaged, and they're buying property together, should you look at them and maybe have a conversation and say, you know, you should probably talk to an attorney about how you're going to take title? Yeah. 
Because how are they going to take title? Tennessee in common, which means what's not possible? Survivorship. Might they need to think about joint tenancy? Because most likely, if two people who are a couple are buying property together, wouldn't they expect that if something happened to one of them, the other one was going to own the property? That's not the way it works, though. See, that's where you got to be the expert and step up and say, now, here's what you don't do. You don't say, you should be joint tenants because that's legal advice and you're not qualified to give legal advice. You know the ultimate answer is that they should be what? Joint tenants. What you say is, you know, you really should talk to an attorney about how you take title. Okay. And then you call the attorney and say, tell them to be joint tenants. Right. <laughs> so if the, if the joint tenancy is there, in the first place, tenancy in common should not even be there, in my opinion. In your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. I've been saying that to the Real Estate Commission for years, in my opinion. And they look at me and they go, oh, bless your heart. You know? <laughs> Tenancy in common is there because we often have ownership between people that we don't want to create these tying binds between them. Think of business partnerships, for example. In a business partnership, if you own this building together, you would not want it such that if I passed away that my business partner is going to automatically take over my ownership. What do I want to have happen? I wanted to go to my heirs, right? So that's why tenancy in common is the default. You know, what, basically, if you want to have this automatic survivorship, you can do one of two things with that person: marry them, or, in my recommendation, be joint tenants with them. You know, it's a lot less uh, binding, sort of thing. Does that make sense? Does it make any difference if you get married after the purchase? It does not make dif a difference if you get married after the purchase because things are not going to change. If you took title as tenants in common and then you get married to that same person, you're still tenants in common. You can change it to tenancy by the entirety, but you would have to change it. It doesn't just magically change. And most people most people do not know to do that. Most people do not know to do that, and they do not have that right of survivorship unless they purchased with the right of survivorship. And there's only two ways to purchase with the right of survivorship. Either be what? Married at the time you purchase, or be joint tenants. So in case of the tenancy by the entirety, as you say, if one spouse dies, even irrespective of whether they have the will or not, the survivorship is there. That's correct. The survivorship is going to so happen let's say the both, irrespective of the If both of them die and they have children, survive, even if they don't have will, the survivorship goes to the children? Or no. 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 Survivorship is only the owners. Survi survivorship doesn't extend to anybody outside of the ownership circle. So in the case of a married couple, we only have two owners, right? So the survivorship only benefits. So if they were both killed at the same time, then it's going to go to a will. That's going to probate. That's going to probate. Then would it go to the children? Depending on what the will said. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have a will. Then it would go to their closest living heirs, which would be the their children. children. And probate determines that. The probate does determine that. That's called the law of intestate succession. If you die without a will, you die intestate. And so the state of North Carolina sets up a will for you. Basically, the state of North Carolina creates a pecking order. Mm -hmm. You know, you look to spouse first. If you have a spouse, that's your heir. If you, have chi if you don't have a spouse but you have children, those are your heirs, and it would be equally divided among your children. No favorites allowed if you, if you die without a You can play favorites, but you better have a will. You know, you can't, if you die without a will, they're going to give it, they're going to split it up equally amongst your children. If you don't have a spouse, you don't have children, then it goes to parents. If you don't have a spouse, you don't have children, you don't have parents, then it goes to siblings. You don't have a spouse, you don't have children, you don't have parents, you don't have siblings. It goes to nieces and nephews and then first cousins. You get after that, it goes to the good old state of North Carolina. That's as far as they look. They try real hard to find people, can't you imagine? <laughs> they work real hard at it before they say, oh, it's ours. <laughs> okay, you with me on this? So this, this survivorship, is this an important benefit? Yes. yes. It's a huge benefit. Avoiding probate is a huge deal because this is going to transfer the ownership instantly. That's a better outcome no matter what, whether the person plans to keep the property or sell the property. Is it a huge benefit to have ownership instantly? Yes. Mm -hmm. No question. No question. Because even something as simple as, let's say, let's say, 
we'll go back to your friend and his girlfriend. Let's say they paid cash for the house. They didn't have a mortgage. So it sounds like, oh, this is going to be easy, right? He dies. He has a will that says it goes to her. Still has to be probated, right? So in the meantime, she owns half of the house, free and clear. But his income was their only income. Does she still need money to eat with? So she can't get a job. She's look, she can't find a job. Normally, would she be able to borrow money against the house to have money to eat with? Can she borrow money against it when she only owns half of it and the other owner is dead and it belongs to his estate? No, she can't take a loan out against that property. You see how complicated that gets? That would have all been solved by what? Well, marriage. <laughs> Let's not go that far. That's an extreme solution. It's a right answer, yes. But isn't it? What could we have solved it short of marriage? Joint tenancy. Joint tenancy would solve that. Common. So tenancy in common, let's talk about it. Now we, we know, we've clarified tenancy in common is between what kind of people? People that are not okay. married to each other, okay? Survivorship is possible or not possible? No. Not possible with tenancy no. in common. So these are unmarried people who are not going to have the right of survivorship. Now there are some pluses to tenancy in common. The pluses are there are no rules. We can have as many owners as we want. Could there be two owners? Mm -hmm. Could there be 200? Yes. Yeah. They also don't have to have any equal ownership shares. You could have five owners and one owns 90% and the other 10% is split amongst the other four. Could they be equal owners? Sure. Do they have to be? No. There's no rules. Here's another thing. Tenants in common, and I guarantee you your buddy and his girlfriend didn't know this. Suppose he comes home one day and he has a new roommate. Can she sell her half of that property without his permission? Yep. Yep. Oh, yes, she can. Sure she can. If she can find somebody willing to buy 50% ownership, he's got homeboy's got a new roommate. <laughs> <laughs> and he can't stop her from doing that. She can't stop him from doing that because in tenancy in common, there are no rules, folks. This is the most flexible form of ownership. So if you're looking for flexibility, what's the best way to own property? Tenancy in common. Tenancy in common. No rules whatsoever. No restrictions on these owners. Are, we, are you following me on that? Mm -hmm. But what's the price they pay for having all this flexibility? They can't have what? Survivorship. Good on that so far? Mm -hmm. Now, joint tenancy. Joint tenancy is still for unmarried people. But these are unmarried people who want to have the right of what? Survivorship. Survivorship. Now, they lose some of the flexibility of tenants in common. Number one, these are going to be equal ownership shares. So if there are two owners, they're each going to own what percent? <laughs> See, you just did your first math in the class. Congratulations. <laughs> if there are three, they're each going to own what? 33. 33. Good. If there are four, they're each going to own 25%. These are going to be equal ownership shares. So you've lost some of that flexibility. All right? Secondly, and most importantly for test taking, joint tenants must have purchased at the same time. In order to be joint tenants, everybody must have purchased at the same time. So when you start talking about joint tenancy versus tenancy in common, for example, remember how I said if you're tenants in common, you can sell your interest without the other person's permission. Remember that? Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing in joint tenancy. You can do the same thing in joint tenancy, but the thing of it is, if I own, let's say Alicia and I buy property together as joint tenants with the right of survivorship, can she sell her half to somebody else? Yes. Without my permission? No. no. Yes. Yes, she can. She can sell her half to somebody else without my permission, but that new person is not going to come in as a joint tenant. They're going to come in as a what? Tenant in common because they did not what at the same time? They didn't purchase at the same time. So they're not going to have that right of survivorship. Alicia had the right of survivorship, but when she sold to somebody else, they come in as a what? Tenant in common with no right of survivorship. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So before I get married, I have my own home. He has his. We get married. 
this is going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that play out if one of us dies? Like, so, first of all, don't get married. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kidding completely, sort of. Uh, <laughs> I joke. I joke. So you both own your own homes right now. All right. First of all, when you get married, you both are transferring 50% ownership to the other spouse in both properties. He will own half of what you own. You will own half of what he owns. You are taking on half of his assets. You are taking on half of his debts. You better run a credit check. And I'm not kidding about that part. Because if he's got $500,000 worth of debt, guess what? It's yours. As soon as you say yes. Any assets you have become half his the day you say I do in this state. Now, this is not real estate law. This is marital law. So I'm not trying to get too deep into this, but that's the way it works in North Carolina. Okay? We are a community property state. So in marital interest, as soon as you say I do, you're transferring 50% of everything, debts and assets. All right? So that's going to complicate selling. Are you planning to keep both houses? Oh, this was just a question. Oh, it's I have a <laughs> Thank God. It's not real life. Because, no, this happens all the time. This happens all the time. Perfect example. This happened to a really good friend of mine. He hired me to sell his townhouse. He and his fiance were engaged. I had sold him a townhouse years before. She owned a house in Medvin. The thought process was they were going to get married, both move into her house, right? So he was going to sell his townhouse put his townhouse on the market, the wedding was scheduled months down the road, we get a buyer, we get under contract. He plays poker a lot, he was going to Vegas for the weekend, the weekend before closing. Okay, fine. So we had him sign all the documents ahead of time, he gives me power of attorney, we're ready to go, we go to closing. Sunday night he calls me just to make sure everything's good for the closing the next day. And I said, yep, everything's good. Um, and he said, he said, well it's been a crazy week out here, I'll tell you about it when I get home. I said, I said, well if you want any money, he said, well, done okay with the gambling he said, uh, he said but that's not the crazy part I said well what do you mean he, he no he got married he got married oh. they decided they were gonna get married in Vegas that weekend and I said Dan <laughs> we can't sell your house tomorrow because I don't have all the owner's signatures on the deed he said yeah I signed everything before I left I said no sir I don't have all the owners, plural, signature on the deed because who owns half of that house now? She does. What if she says no? Can she stop the sale right there? Sure she can. He said, he said, is that really true? He said, that is really true. He said, Shannon's got to sign that deed. And he said, okay, well, we're going to get on, the, we're going to fly home tonight then. So they did. They took the red eye home and they signed the deed. Before we walked into the closing attorney's office, I pulled him to the side. I said, Dan, <laughs> friend to friend, let me just tell you now, when you go in here and you sign everything, you know you're not going to get a check right now, right? And he said, yeah, I know. It's not going to be until this afternoon until they record the documents and everything. I said, you do realize that check is going to have both of your names on them, correct? He said, you're shitting me. I said, I am not. For <laughs> one day of marriage. I am not. Welcome to marriage. <laughs> He said, he said, we don't have an account together. I said, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> you better go open one. He said, well, what if, I mean, won't she have access to the money? I said, it's her money too. And he said, well, that's crazy. I said, congratulations on getting married. Because <laughs> that's the way that works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now. Just because they got married didn't make it tenancy by the entirety. That's different. Does that is everybody? Does that matter? It didn't. It didn't become tenancy by the entirety is only for things that you purchase while you're married. Does everybody follow me on that? They are not tenants by the entirety just because they got married. Okay, that's a whole different thing. Tenancy by the entirety is for things that you purchase while you are married. Can you own something with your spouse as tenants in common? Yes, if you bought it as what? Unmarried. Unmarried. You can certainly own it. If, we, if, if they buy it, your friends buy it as tenants in common, he and his girlfriend, and then they go on to get married, they're still going to be tenants in common. Does, everybody, does that make sense for everybody? It doesn't change automatically just because you got married. 
they can do a quick claim deed. They can do a quick claim deed and change it to tenancy by the entirety. They can certainly change it into tenancy by the entirety, but that's not going to happen automatically. And that's the kind of thing they're going to ask you on a test. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, so-and-so bought this property when they were single, and then later on they got married, and then they bought another property, and they're going to ask you about the status of the two properties. They're trying to talk you into the fact that both properties are tenancy by the entirety, but they're not. The one they bought after they were married is tenancy by the entirety. The one they bought prior to being married is either tenancy in common or joint tenancy. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So now let me give you an example. Isaiah, Kelly, and Donna have bought a property together as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Okay. But in fact, let's just draw it. Let's draw it so you can see. So, how many owners did I say we have? Three. 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 We got three owners. I'm going to draw it as a pie chart because I think it's easier to draw it as a pie chart. Okay? We said Isaiah... Kelly and Donna, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah, Kelly, and Donna. They are joint tenants. What do we know about their ownership interest? It's equal. It's equal. Mm -hmm. So they each own, what, 33.3%? Mm -hmm. Something like that? Each one of them? Yeah. All the same. Everybody agree with me so far? Yeah. Yeah. And they are joint tenants. In common. No, joint tenants. With the right of what? Joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So that means that if something happens to one of them, what's going to happen to that person's ownership interest? It's going to be split between the surviving owners. That's why it's called survivorship. Does that make sense? So Isaiah decides he wants out. Isaiah sells. And he sells to Tara. Okay, so out goes Isaiah and in comes Tara. What happens to the relationship between Tara and Kelly? Is it still joint tenancy? No. 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 It is what? Tenancy in common. Tenancy in common. How about the relationship between Tara and Donna? Joint tenancy goes away, becomes tenancy in common. Correct? Mm -hmm. What about the relationship between Donna and Kelly? It remains joint tenancy. Kelly is killed in a horrific car accident. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Exactly. Shit happens, right? <laughs> Kelly's killed. Now. Talk to me about what's going to happen with Kelly's share of the ownership. It's going to go to the one remaining joint tenant who has the benefit of survivorship. Isn't that what it's going to look like? You're going to have Donna as a tenant in common with Tara. But Tara's going to own one-third, mm -hmm. and Donna's going to own two-thirds. <laughs> and they're both going to be tenants in common with each other because there's no remaining joint tenants. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you get these test questions, do you see how drawing it as a pie chart could help? Because yeah. you can do the little intersecting mm -hmm. lines and label them as tenants in common or joint tenants and then make yeah. the changes as you need to go? Mm -hmm. That's how I recommend you do it on the test. Yeah. Okay. What if Tara dies? Then what happens? So what if Tara dies? What's Tara's relationship with Donna? And it's in common. So is that going to impact the ownership of the property at all? No. No. It's going to go to TH. Tara's heirs. Okay. Tara's heirs. Tara, she wanted to kill you off. You notice that. I think I'm dead. I noticed that. A lot of death and destruction in this day. How do we feel about that? Understand the differences between tenancy in common and joint yes. tenancy so far? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, let me do this. I'm going to restart it on the wrong slide. Now let's talk about tenancy by the entirety. We've already built up to it. We know that survivorship is what? With tenancy by the entirety. 
Is it there? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Tennessee by the entirety, it's automatic. There's no working around it. So anytime you buy property with a spouse, what what ownership shares are going to be? 50-50. Two owners, equal shares. Here's the big catch with tenancy by the entirety. It has the least flexibility. Remember when I asked you this question before, I said, could a joint tenant sell their ownership without the permission of the other owner? And what was the answer? Yes. 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 You cannot do that in tenancy by the entirety. Tenancy by the entirety, you can't sell your portion of the ownership without the permission of your spouse. How many of you have heard a very old expression, it takes one to buy and two to sell? That's where this comes from. Because Carolyn can go out and buy a property without her spouse's knowledge. Has no idea. Guess what they still are in the property? Tenants by the entirety. Carolyn owns it for 20 years. It's her little hideaway. She doesn't tell anybody. She gets ready to sell it. Guess who has to sign that deed to sell? That spouse does. Whether they ever paid a dime on it, whether they ever knew it existed, they are a 50% owner. Can she even, maybe she says, well, look, I, I don't even want, I, I don't want to tell me about it, so I'm only going to sell my half. Can she do that? Nope. No. no. Tenants by the entirety. What, yes. What about property outside the U.S.? I'm, More married. What about, this is only applies to property in North Carolina. Okay. Okay. This is property in North Carolina. Okay. I don't know about, you know, I, sort of, I don't even know about other states, which doesn't matter. <laughs> this is true in most states, though, by the way. This is the way most states handle this. Well, this pretty much presumes that these are cash purchases, because I can't imagine having a mortgage on a property unless it's a government loan, where you, you know, somebody sells off and... Uh, yeah, you, when you start talking about selling, when you start talking about selling a poor, you know, if you have like a 50% interest in something and selling it, you, good luck finding a buyer, right? You know, that, and remember that that's sort of a hypothetical type thing. You know, you're probably not going to find a buyer who's willing to, and like you say, if you have a mortgage on it, the ability to do that is going to be very limited as well. Do, so, you, do you see this type, do you see this often? Do I see what off? Uh, tenancy, you know, uh, joint tenancy, tenancy in common? Tenancy, well, tenancy, you're going to see joint tenancy and tenancy in common anytime the two purchasers are not married. Okay. You know, so yeah, the, the answer to that is absolutely. And unfortunately, we see tenancy in common much more commonly than we do joint tenancy. You would think that most people who are buying, especially a house together, would probably prefer to have survivorship, would you not? Mm -hmm. Why do you think most of them don't? They don't know about it. They don't know about it. They don't know. So is it the responsibility of the real estate agent, or do they need, like you say, get in contact with an attorney? They need to get in contact with an attorney. I would say, Demetrius's question is, do I have to save them from themselves, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. My answer to that would be, you can't tell them how they should take title. That's legal advice. By the way, you might see that on a test somewhere. That's legal advice, how they take title. Could you warn them about a potential problem? In other words, could you say to them, you know, I think you should talk to an attorney about how you plan to take title. Mm -hmm. That's not giving legal advice. That is telling them you should seek legal advice about this thing. And so I would say that's where your responsibility would lie. If you know that they're buying it as a couple and that they would probably want to have survivorship and they're not married, you should probably say to them, hey, you should ask the attorney about this. You should ask the attorney what they think about how you're going to take title. Meanwhile, pick up the phone and call the attorney because you're going to be in contact with the closing attorney and say, you know, they're not married, but they're dating, so they probably should be joint tenants and the attorney's going to go, all right, yeah. And they're going to do it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. But there's a fine line between you telling them to talk to an attorney about it and you telling them this is what you should do. Right. Make sure you know where that line is. It's a really good question. How do we feel about these? Okay. Tenancy in common, joint tenancy, tenancy by the entirety. What's the big thing that differentiates them? Survivorship. survivorship. You got one where survivorship's always there, that's tenancy by the entirety. You got one where it's never there, so that's yeah. tenancy in common. And you got one that sits in the middle. Those are people who don't want to be married but want to act like they are for purposes of owning that one property anyway. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Good. Um, 
Last couple things we want to mention here. It's going to actually be pretty good timing, I think. Um, we're going to wind down chapter two here. We want to talk about common interest ownership. Let's talk about condos. Condos are a pretty unique form of ownership. When we, earlier in the day, we said when you buy real estate, what are you buying first and foremost? The land. The land. Guess what? When you buy a condo, you ain't buying no land. The simple truth is when you buy a condo, you don't own any land. You're buying airspace. You're buying the airspace inside your unit. As a matter of fact, you're not even buying the physical structure. Who do you think owns the land and the physical structure? Not the developer. I heard somebody say it. Say that again. The association. The National Basketball Association. Oh, the Homeowners Association. The Homeowners Association, which is really just a group of who? Homeowners. So here's the key. Was I wrong when I said you're not buying land? Yes. Yeah, you are buying land. But the thing is, you're not buying the land under your unit. You're buying into the land with everybody else. You're buying into the building with everyone else. At, you got 100, 200 owners together who are all coming and going at different times. What kind of ownership, what kind of relationship are they going to have with each other? Tenancy and common. Got to be because they're not buying at the same time. They're not married to one another, right? All these hundred people I hope aren't married to one another. So, <laughs> they're going to be tenants in common with each other. So if I buy a condo, I'm actually buying two separate things. I'm buying the airspace, my unit, by myself. But I'm also buying my share of everything that the HOA owns. And what does the HOA own? The land, the building parking lot, the swimming pool, the clubhouse, the HOA owns all of it. We call them the common elements, right? So here's how you recognize a condo on a test. I'm buying my unit in severalty by myself, right? But I'm also buying my share of the common elements with all the other owners as tenants in what? Common. common. People ask me all the time, who pays the taxes on the land on a condo? Who always pays the taxes on the land? The owner. And who owns the land? The HOA, which is really just who? All of us together. So who's going to pay the taxes? All of us together. You ever heard of dues? Do condos have monthly dues? Who maintains buildings normally? The owner maintain and who owns these buildings? The HOA, which is really just what? Everybody. So who's going to pay to maintain the buildings? All of us together. Again, dues. That's why they're there. To cover maintenance, to cover property taxes, to cover insurance. Don't we have to have insurance on this building? And since we all own it together, we got to all go together and buy the insurance, right? That's the way a condo association functions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the key here is we don't own what? Land. The land underneath our particular unit. What that means is that condos can look like this. They can be stacked. They can be vertical. No other form of ownership in North Carolina can be stacked vertically. Because when you buy anything else, you buy a townhouse, you buy a detached home, no matter what else you buy, what are you buying first and foremost? The land, the land underneath that structure. With a condo, you're not buying the land underneath that structure because that land is collectively owned by everybody. Are we good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. So, this you need to know. You will be tested on this. I want you to put a star beside this in your, in your notes. This is going to show up in the North Carolina specific section of the exam. And folks, I can tell you, you're not going to struggle with the national section. You're going to struggle with the North Carolina specific section. This is where people struggle because this is the nitpicky stuff. You need to know this law, the North Carolina Condominium Act of 1986. And yes, you need to know 1986, because they'll put 1968 on the thing. <laughs> you know. I saw one exam, the Condominium Act of 1786. Of course there were no condos <laughs> in 1786. Come on now. <laughs> the Condominium Act of 1986. 
First thing you need to know is it only applies to new construction condos. Does it apply to resale? No. 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 Only new construction. Never before occupied condominiums. This law only applies to condos that have never been previously occupied. Are we good on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. No protection whatsoever for a resale condominium. Just new construction. All right. Now, the big thing to know about it down here at the bottom. When the law is in effect, and it would be in effect if it's what kind of a condo? New construction. New construction. So if you're buying a new condominium, you have seven days from the time you sign that purchase contract to do what? Change your mind and get all your money back. You have seven days from the time you sign that purchase contract to change your mind and get all your money back. It's called a right of rescission. How many days? Seven. Seven days. Seven. Seven days. Get all your money back. Even if it says non-refundable on the contract. Because the law says if you're buying a new condo, you have this right. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. Do you have this right if you're buying a condo that somebody's already living in? No. 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 Only if it's what? Yes. Good. Good. Co-ops. You may see co-ops on a tent. You will not see them in real life in North Carolina because I've never seen one. But you may see them on the test. A cooperative generally exists in the bigger cities like New York, Philadelphia, Boston. Uh, the bigger, older, northeastern cities have a lot of co-ops. Co-ops are an interesting form of ownership because you're not actually buying real estate again. You're buying stock. When you buy into a co-op, you're buying stock, you know, shares, in a corporation. And that corporation only has one asset, the building. So. You buy shares of stock in the corporation that owns this building, and in exchange for buying those shares of stock, guess what you get to do? Live, yeah. Live in the building. That's how you recognize a co-op. So what would you be looking for on a test that would tell you that's a co-op? Shares. Stock. Shares. stock. Shares of stock. Corporation. Shares. Stock. Any of that. Those are going to be your buzzwords for recognizing that it's a co-op. I'm not going to spend any more time on it than that, because guess what you'll never see in real life? No. A co-op. They're not here. So you don't have to worry about them. But you need to be able to recognize it on a test. Are we okay with that? If you see shares, if you see stock, if you see corporation, that's a co-op. Good? Yes. All right. Townhouses. Townhouses really don't need a lot of explanation. From all intents and purposes in the state of North Carolina, a townhouse is a house. It's a detached home. It just happens to share at least one wall with another home. You still own the land. When you purchase a townhouse, you own the land that the house sits on. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Understand me there? The only complication here is that when you share a wall with somebody, there's going to be some reliance on each other. Like, for example, look at the roof up here. If there's a leak in the roof, could the leak over my roof negatively impact my neighbor? Yes. 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 Absolutely it could. If I don't have the money to fix my roof, is that a problem for my neighbor? Yes. So, if you were setting up a townhouse, would you want to leave maintenance to the individual property owners, or would you want to make it a responsibility of the association? The association, because there's a mutual benefit involved. Does everybody see that? Yes. Folks, that's required in a, town, in a condo, right? In condos, maintenance is always done by the association, because who owns the building? The association. Townhouses, it's not required for it to be that way. There are townhouses out there where there is no mutual agreement for maintenance. Matter of fact, if you want to see them, go down Wake Forest Road right here. When you get to Old Wake Forest Road, y'all know where Bojangles is down here? Bojangles and Red Lobster, that's Old Wake Forest Road. If you take a right right there, about a quarter of a mile on the left, is a townhouse neighborhood called Brook Forest. It's a relatively new townhouse neighborhood. I say relatively new. It was built in 2003, 2004. I guess that's old now. but relatively new. 
people have loved to buy in there over the years, and one of the major attractions is the low HOA dues. They're 60 bucks a month. Guess what they don't include? Maintenance. Maintenance. Now, here's my question for you, and this is why I've been telling my clients for years when they were interested in there. What the hell's going to happen when those things need roofs? And by the way, ain't that coming up pretty soon at this point? Because they're all the same roof. What are you going to do? Replace just your section of the roof while your neighbor doesn't replace theirs? How's that going to work? The answer is, not very well. So is that something to be concerned about if you're buying in that neighborhood? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But with townhouses, we do have this shared wall, so we have to be concerned about that. Each townhouse is individually owned. The land is individually owned. So can townhouses be stacked? No, because no, you own the <coughs> land underneath them. Now, there is still going to be common areas with a townhouse. Is the parking lot a common area? Yes. yes. Is the, if it has a clubhouse, is that a common area? Mm -hmm. Who's going to own the common area? The HOA. The HOA. Always. If there's any common areas, those are always going to be owned by the HOA. Don't confuse that with a condo where the HOA not only owns the common areas, but the actual structures themselves and the land. With a townhouse, who owns that structure? The individual owner does. Okay. Everybody good with this? The differentiation there? Good. And then the last one. This is it for today. I promise. I'm going to leave you with the ugly one. <laughs> the timeshare. Somebody give me a definition of a timeshare. Worst investment possible. Worst investment possible. <laughs> I'm glad I'm running the camera because that might be the best definition I've ever gotten in class. Worst idea ever, right? If you if you've ever how many of you have been to some resort somewhere, you know, for a free weekend, and all you have to do is sit through a 60-minute prep, and then they locked you in a room with no food or water for a week, <laughs> right, until you bought something, and that thing you bought is called a timeshare. A timeshare, here's what a timeshare is. A timeshare is essentially a lease, but it's a lease you've bought for life. Does that make sense? Rather than renting. So imagine if you go to this place and you like it so much that you just want to reserve it every year, this same week, forever. Well, you can do that. It's called a timeshare. These are like leases that never end. But short-term leases, not a long-term lease. You're only leasing it for how long every year? A week. A week, right? That's the timeshare. In North Carolina, Everything about timeshares is in multiples of five. So anytime in North Carolina you are making reservations on a property for more than five time periods, so like five or more weeks, spread out over the course of five or more years. So five or more reservations over the course of five or more years is going to be considered a timeshare in this state. Does everybody understand that definition? You better because you're going to see it on a test. Don't space out on this one. It's a bad time to space. You're going to see this on a test, I can assure you. Yes, ma'am. I will, absolutely. So, a timeshare in this state is defined as five or more time periods or reservations. So, I want to go Memorial Day week every year. And somebody says, well, how many years? I don't know. The next 10 years. Is that five or more time periods? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm doing it how often? Every, Every year for how many years? Ten. For 10 years. So how many times am I doing it? 10. Ten. Ten. Over the course of how many years? 10. Ten. 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 Is that at least five? Yes. yes. Over at least five years? Yes. So that's a what? Timeshare. Time share. The state just said that's a timeshare. If I don't want to get into timeshare territory, i got to only reserve it how many times? Four. 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 I got to stop at four. If I go five or more, I just went into timeshare territory. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. So now that I've gone into timeshare territory, <coughs> let's talk about how the state regulates timeshares. North Carolina is exceptionally strict on timeshares. There are three states that are exceptionally not strict on timeshares. South Carolina is indeed <laughs> one of them. Florida would also indeed be one of them. And there's one more, that, that shining star in the desert, Nevada. Because when you get those little cards in the mail that says, come spend a weekend with us, where are they asking you to go? Vegas. Vegas. 
Myrtle Beach, Orlando. Because those states have almost no laws regarding the sale of timeshares. The first law they don't have in those states, you don't have to be licensed to sell them. In fact, you know who's most likely in there trying to sell you a timeshare when you go to one of those places? Mm -mm. The other people who have bought timeshares. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. That's the truth. Because when you buy a timeshare, you're not done with the purchase. They got these maintenance fees that you got to pay year after year. And they'll tell you, oh, don't worry. You can cover your maintenance fees by selling two timeshares. So when you go use your week, rather than being on vacation, you're in the damn office trying to sell this thing to somebody else. <coughs> That's how they work. You can't do that in North Carolina, because in North Carolina to sell timeshares, guess what the first rule is? You gotta have a real estate license. You gotta have a real estate license in North Carolina to sell timeshares. And the big one, timeshare companies hate this. Because timeshares are super high pressure. Those of you who have been in that presentation, was it high pressure? Oh, yeah. yeah. They'd do anything to get you to buy it, right? In North, if you ever get invited to a timeshare presentation in North Carolina, go. Don't worry about it. Go. Because here's what you're going to do. When they walk in the room and they try to sell you, say, listen, I don't want to waste your time. I want to buy the most expensive one you got. Here's my credit card number. <laughs> Read that. Yep. Uh -huh. Five day. Right of rescission. When you get home from your vacation, call them back. <laughs> <laughs> because any timeshare sold in this state, you have five days to change your mind. Five days to change your mind. So, are there very many timeshares sold in this state? No. Now keep in mind, it's not about where the timeshare facilities are. There are a boat ton of timeshare facilities in North Carolina. But the timeshares are sold where? South Carolina. South Carolina, Florida, Nevada. They might be used in North Carolina, but the sale takes place in one of those three states. Does that make sense for everybody? This only governs, this doesn't matter where the building is, this governs where the transaction takes place. So don't go to Myrtle Beach and do that and say, Travis told me I could get out of it. No. You gotta be in North Carolina. In this state. Okay? And don't let them take you out on a boat in the international waters and do it either. Right? On ground. In North Carolina. In fact, you ought to ask the question, like, how far am I from the border? Let's go this way. Make sure we're not in South Carolina. Generally speaking, a lot of life's problems can be avoided by staying outside. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Okay. Do we understand that? Yeah. Okay. So how do we define a timeshare? Five or more reservations or time periods that have to be used over a period of, what period of time? Five or more years. And you get how many days to change your mind? You, you notice a trend here? Five, right? We're not done with the fives yet. One more. This is, and I'm going to say this very sternly because you're going to see this on a test. The North Carolina Real Estate Commission does not have the power to fine people with a real estate license. The Real Estate Commission cannot fine me. <coughs> they can't force me to pay them money. They can't force me to pay money back to a client. They can't do anything with money. They can't tell me how much to charge. They can't tell me how much not to charge. In fact, they can only assess one fine ever, and it's to a timeshare developer. And it's up to $500 per violation. So let me tell you what a violation looks like. Remember I said you got to be licensed to sell timeshares in North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. Demetrius goes and gets a job at a timeshare developer in Wilmington. Does he have a real estate license? No. He does not. He sits in there and he meets with 50 couples in a day. Every single one of those is a violation. So that's going to be 50 times 500 for that one day. But this is the only time the Real Estate Commission has the authority to fine anyone. Are we good on that? Mm -hmm. So anything you see on a test that's anybody else about being fined is wrong. Mm -hmm. Are we good with that? Mm -hmm. No fining of licensees. Only fine the Real Estate Commission can issue is of a who? A timeshare developer. Not an agent, but a developer. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. And the maximum fine is $500 per violation. Not a maximum fine of $500. That's different. Because that would mean the only thing they could be charged is 500. They can be charged much more than 500. It's 500 per violation. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Those are timeshares. And that is it for chapter two. Look at that. We only went four minutes over. How about that?
All right, so I know I, I know I've run over, and I apologize for that. I'll make up four minutes next week, maybe. Don't um, <laughs> hold it again. Um, for next week, please have read chapters one through four. If you haven't already read chapters one and two that we just covered, you need to read those. Okay. Please read ahead chapters three and four. I would highly encourage you, if you have time, to watch the videos for chapters three and four. I'm not going to say I highly encourage you to watch videos for one and two because that's going to go without saying, right? You're going to definitely study and watch one and two. Hopefully, you will also watch ahead for three and four. Everybody okay with that? All right. I will see you next Sunday. Thank you. Take your name tags so and you can bring them back. I'm going to walk